All right. Um, good evening. Good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to see all of you, and it's a pleasure to be here tonight. So once again, Marius, thank you for the invitation. Big hi to all of you that are watching us online. Uh, my name is Stan. I'm VP of product at AppMagic, an analytical tool for analyzing mobile markets and gaining actionable insights. Today, I will be talking about how to evaluate new game mobile ideas and how to work with them. My presentation will take roughly 20 minutes, give or take, and the rest will be for the questions. Most of the data and the knowledge I will be talking about was based on our tools at AppMagic, but the principles used can be used with any tool on the market. At least that's what I'm thinking. So uh, the, the topic itself is very wide and broad, and of course it can be covered in 20 minutes. I tried to pack my speech with as much usefulness as I could. So all the little tips, tricks, and knowledge we've gathered both inside the company and with our partners and clients. So, without any further ado, let's dig in. Oops. Um, yeah, by the way, don't forget to ask the questions if there are any. Before we move to evaluating game ideas and talking about it, it's really important to understand the statistics behind our choices. Roughly 10,000 games appear monthly in the stores that will be ranked at least once. So at least once during their lifetime, they will be featured and they will be seen by their target audience. Two thirds of these games are well produced, well built and well executed. So they were dedicated teams of experts working on a great game. Yet only 3% of them will acquire more than $100 in a lifetime. And we definitely want to be among these 3%. So let's try to increase our chances tonight. First of all, when we are talking about evaluating game ideas, it's really important to know what type of game do we want to build. So the identification process. Usually there are two cases, two major ways. We either know an exact game we're inspired by, or we know a genre. Either way, we, we know that it's important to check if anyone else has come up with the same idea before. Say we've downloaded Marvel Snap. <laughs> yeah, sure, sure. All right, so say we downloaded Mar Marvel Snap. We've played it with the team, we liked it, the gameplay, the mechanics, the aesthetics, absolutely brilliant. And now we want to make a game of our own. What is important to understand is what type of niche Marvel Snap takes. And for that, it is useful to have some kind of a categorization system. And the more precise it is, the better result we will get. This, this is one of the reasons, by the way, we at AppMagic have a dedicated team of experts categorizing each and every game coming to the market. So every day, every game is categorized. For example, with Marvel Snap, we can see it's a card game, but going deeper, it's a collectible card game. So it's already something. We also can uh, gain some information about the setting, superheroes, and about the art style. 3D and normal. This can be useful when we are building a variation of an already successful game with a very catchy core gameplay, uh, and I will talk about it in a minute. Now, we know the genre, but we want to go deeper and know who are the main competitors, what is going on there from a high-level perspective. For that, we can try to choose this genre and then see all the top three and top grossing games in this niche. So now we know who are the main competitors, what are the average profitability of each one of them, what is the revenue distribution in the genre. By the way, it's a good time to give my first tip. So usually when people research different niche, they're looking at top grossing apps, best of the best. And it's quite logical, you want to know the best practices. But don't try to compete with the giants unless you are a giant yourself or your name is David. So apparently uh, there can be a danger of survivorship bias. Not all, the, all of the companies and publishers up there in the tops know the exact key ingredient of their success. And following someone who doesn't know what was the key ingredient of the success isn't the best strategy. Secondly, 
there is a problem of unequal conditions. So usually guys at the top have bigger marketing budgets, bigger teams and bigger expertise. So it's much more useful, especially in the beginning, to compete with your peers and then grow your way up to the tops. And last but not least, pay attention to the underdogs. So it's very important to know the best practices that can be taken from the top grossing games, but also it's sometimes very useful to find hidden gems. For that, we have a special instrument called advanced search that helps to search very specific things with a set of criteria. For example, like in this example, we can look up uh, the games that were released during last year in the collectible card games niche that acquired from 20 to $100,000. They were not very profitable, but still they found their audience and they gained some money. So maybe, maybe there are some features or game mechanics or monetization systems that we can use. Now, going from games and genre to the market level. It is really useful to understand, is there any market at all? What are the competitors? How big is it? Is there a status quo? Is it growing or shrinking? It's good to compare chosen market segments with each other on a high level, and then choosing one, going deeper and analyzing the one you more, see more potential in. For example, once again, taking Marvel Snap. Say, now we have a choice. We know about Marvel Snap, but also there is a game called Survivor, and it is big as well. It is very successful, going big, released in this year, this summer actually as well. So how do we choose between these two market segments? The first one is collectible card games. That is what we already know. And the second one is Survival Arena. Actually, that's a unique tech we're using at AppMagic for games like Survivor. So when looking on a high level perspective, we can uh, right away see two things. Well, first of all, during the same period of time, collectible card games market segment acquired one and a half times more revenue than Survival Arena. And there might be several reasons for that. The market segment can be more mature, and it definitely is. The pain base can be much more loyal, or the audience can pay better. But all in all, we can see there is more money in this genre. But from the downloads perspective, the situation is opposite. So survival arena niche gains much more downloads. So right now, it seems like both of these genres are quite attractable. We might want to use both of them. So let's go deeper. And for that, let's look at the revenue perspective, revenue graph for both of these market segments. You can spot on two interesting things. Well, first, you might be asking, all right, why are we beginning from July? Why last half a year? Why not begin from the beginning of the year? The answer is simple. Survival Arena as a genre appeared during this summer with the release of Survivor. So it's pretty rational to use the middle of the summer. And the second thing, we can see that collectible card games market segment is very stable. It is fluctuating around 40 million plus a take, uh, give or take. And it loaded a little bit. Then with the release of Marvel Snap, it went on a rise. But all in all, it's very stable. At the same time, Survival Arena is growing rapidly. And after a couple of months, there is a place where it reached and exceeded collectible card games market segment. So it is a new market. There is no status quo whatsoever. We will have to check it, but as for now, it seems so. There are a lot of money there and it is growing. So maybe there is a place for us as well. By the way, talking about collectible card games, it's a good time to share my second tip. Don't lose into the trap markets. So-called trap markets are markets that are neither growing nor shrinking. So usually it means that the developers out there can't buy traffic with positive ROMI, return of marketing investment. So basically for every dollar spent, you receive one dollar back. And you can scale up in this situation. And it's a crucial in mobile game world. So taking one step further, usually it means that other niche or game genres with other developers acquire the same target audience much better. So looking at their collectible card games market through the last couple of years, we, we can see that it, it was very stable. It is on a plateau. Except for this situation in September last year, when a big uh, Harry Potter IP game was released in China. 
and even eat uh, decreased very heavily, and now it is not one of the best competitors out there. So the whole market is very stable. There is a chance you can disrupt it, but you need very heavy arguments. This can be a very strong IP, a very unique expertise in the genre, and Marvel Snap has both. So Marvel is a very strong IP indeed, and the team behind Marvel Snap back in the days created Hearthstone. So guys probably knew what they were doing. All right, we know the game, we know the genres, we know the market. It's the best time to look at the competitors. Who are we competing with? It's useful to research both direct competitors and non-obvious ones that are fighting for the same target audience. And it's good to know their strengths, what are their best practices and their key ingredients of success, and learn from their mistakes, what we can improve to take the game to the next level. When we're talking about direct competitors, it's useful to look at the market segment. For example, for Survival Arena, once again, we're looking at the top six positions from the revenue and downloads perspective. And right away, we can see one interesting detail. Survivor AO gains the majority of the revenue in this field, like more than 95%. There is a competitor, Lonely Survivor, that gains 15 times less. All the other apps are gaining 100, uh, 130 times less revenue. And actually, it's a typical situation when we are talking about a very surprisingly success successful game with a catchy core gameplay that can be copied pretty easily. And uh, there are a lot of companies out there that try to do it. But for us, it might be good news because there is no status quo. The leaderboard is not set yet. And we can learn the best practices of what should be done from top two positions and then learn what shouldn't be done from the rest of the tail. Now to the non-obvious competitors with the same target audience. Um, for that, we use a unique tool at AppMagic called Similarity Graph. What it basically does, it helps us not to look at the same niche or the same genre, but rather understand what type of apps or games focus on the same audience. This is the graph built for Survivor IO. And of course, we can see the Lonely Survivor here as well, just like on the previous slide. And it's pretty rational, the main competitor. But at the same time, we can see our share a game very close to this one. And it might be surprising. Though it's very understandable because both Archero and Survivor were published by the same company called Heavy, And they share the majority of the same audience so they can use cross advertising. And that is one of the reasons, by the way, why other Archero clones are here on the graph as well. You would never find it when you search in the same niche or in the same genre, but searching by the same target audience, you can clearly see it. And now is the best time for my third and last tip, talking about Archeros and copycats. Do not just copycat. So there are times when there is a big trend going on on the market. There is big hype and everyone are looking at it. On the one side, it is really important to know the trends and to use them. And it might be a good idea to build a variation of a successful game, but in other setting or other art style. But at the same time, it's really important to address it with cold head and analytics. Because looking at Archero and all the clones, from the moment of its release in June 2019, it was a big blast, going up to 13, 40 million dollars. And during this peak, all the industry was looking at Archero and there were a lot of companies thinking, all right, we can gather a small team, take some store assets and build the same game and maybe be successful. But they didn't reach the analytics. And there were two things that should be considered. First, looking at Archero itself, right after the initial peak, it began decreasing rapidly. And now it is on a plateau that is four times less than the peak. And secondly, out of 60 copies that were produced during this time, more than 60 actually, only three games can be seen on this graph. So only three potential competitors were released during three years out of 60. 95% of the copycats were not successful, they didn't make it. 
So when trying to make a copycat, when trying to copy some kind of a core gameplay, even though it can be easily developed, always remember to address it with some kind of analytics, with a data-driven approach. So, to sum it up, when we are trying to develop a new game and evaluate game ideas, the first step should be identification, understanding how we specify type of game we are building. It's really important not to fight with the giants, because there is always a danger of survivorship bias, the conditions might be unequal, and remember to look for hidden gems as well in your niche. Secondly, compare and analyze different target niches, address different markets and compare them. And when doing this, be aware of traps and status quo. When you don't have strong IP, unique expertise in the niche, or maybe a very broad and deep expertise in the gaming in general, it's not the best idea to address trap markets. And last but not least, research your direct and non-obvious competitors. Work with them, love them, and they will help you. But do not just copycat. Use your analytics, use statistics, use data from the market in order to gain success. That's all.